Eğer ki Eğer ki Hayatımızda hiç eğer Olmasaydı nasıl olur? Size şöyle söyleyeyim Her şey daha az parlak Daha az yeşil olur Ve daha az parlak yeşil Çünkü eğerler Ormanların derinliklerinde Tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşler Eğerler Nobel ve Gagenheim'ın aklına takılır ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırarlar. Asla yalnız yürümezler ve aşırı bulaşıcı durlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler günü umursamazlar. Robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıl dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Mr. President, dear colleagues, it is my honor and pleasure to chair the first session of the uh, of the fifth international conference on new developments in soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. But I don't know how to express my feelings of pleasure and honor to present Dr. Suzanne Lacas, who is one of the greatest geotechnical heroes of this century. And I would like to give a brief uh, bio about Suzanne Lacasse. Of course, this is far away from uh, presenting her. And uh, even with this, uh, just a glimpse of this biographical statement, uh, we will again, we will must, once more again, our feelings of admiration to her. Dr. Suzanne Lacasse from Noranda, Quebec, did her Bachelor of Arts at University de Montréal and her civil engineering degrees at Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. She was on the faculties of Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal from 1973 to 1975 and MIT from 1971 to 1983. Dr. Lacasse then moved to the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, NGI, in Oslo, where she became managing director in 1991. Until she stepped down in 2012, uh, she made incredible uh, contributions and she is still continuing and now acting as expert advisor for NGI. She is also honorary prof professor at Tongi University, Shanghai, Zhejiang University, Guangzhou, and Shanghai Jiachong University. During her career, Dr. Lacasse focused on combining mathematical and numerical analysis with practical geotechnical engineering design. Presently, she works, among others, on risk management and uh, risk assessment and management for offshore structures landslides, tunnels, and water retaining and tailing stamps. Dr. Lacasse received four doctorates, honoris causa, from Scotland, Norway, and Canada, 
the Robert Leggett Award of the Canadian Geotechnical Society, the Canada Medal of the Engineering Institute of Canada, and the Effective Teaching Award in Civil Engineering at MIT. She is elected member of the National Academy of Engineers in the US, Canada, Norway, and France. She published over 370 papers and gave the Terzaki Lecture, the Rankin Lecture, uh, Terzaki Lecture in 2001, the Rankin Lecture in two, 2015, and will give the Carillo Lecture this year in 2022. An international lecture was established in her honor, the Susan Lacasse Lecture on Risk and Reliability in Geotechnical Engineering. Dr. Lacasse is Officer of the Order of Canada and Knight of the First Order of the Falcon in Ireland. And now I don't want to steal uh, any more time of this uh, wonderful speaker. And please, Dr. Susan Lacas, uh, could you take the scene? And we are ready to listen your invaluable speech. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fesa. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, I do. Okay. So I will share my screen. Share, share screen. Yes. And this one. Do you see a PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> and then, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I go in presenter. I should it should go in presenter mode. Is it in presenter mode now? It it is, but it can be enlarged a bit. Oh, it's the wrong screen. Uh, Erambe. Like this? Is yes. this better? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So you get the full screen. Okay, I, I apologize for all these things, but this is what I was most nervous about is the connection. So I assume now that you see the main screen with the presentation. And uh, first, thank you, Faisa, for this introduction. And I, I'm very, very pleased to be one of your key keynote lecturers. So I said yes right away. And first, I have to congratulate Faisa and Kavit and all the other people who made this possible. This conference, I mean, it has been planned for quite a while. And we had so many changes and um, postponing. And then you still pull it off. I am very impressed. So thank you very much for all your effort in making this conference a reality. Um, welcome. Good morning from Norway. Uh, in Norway now, it's a beautiful summer. We have 22 hours of daylight. And, and you know, we all feel, although we're working, we all feel we're on vacation because the sun is shining and it is so warm. So, but today I will be talking about reducing landslide risk and with many examples from Norway, and then you will see snow. <laughs> um, and is how emerging challenges and novel technology can help us reduce risk. And first, here's an area in Norway where there's a high landslide hazard. There's a high probability that a, that a landslide will occur at some point in time. But there is nobody, let me get the pointer. Yeah. There is nobody living downstream. The slope is here. There's nobody living down this area. It's only farmland. So the consequences of a landslide are not so important. So the risk is low. Now, slope stabilization measures were implemented in order to establish a new series of buildings for the population. And so this reduced the probability of a slide occurring. Yes. But the urbanization or people wanting to live, the, 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 this desire was expanded quite a bit and many more buildings were built. And the slope is still here. 
but, but it's because we reduce the probability of a landslide occurring, the people came and established themselves in the area, and the risk is much higher because there are many more elements at risk that are exposed and vulnerable. And this is what happened in December, 30th of December, 2020. A landslide did occur, taking with it many houses and causing deaths. I will come back to this. And that is because several events occurred, changing the level of risk from the initial situation when there was nobody living in the area. As an introduction is we can reduce landslide risk with the help of recent technological advances. And society and construction standards today required that we make decision with information about the risk it involves. So it's called risk informed decision. So there are new challenges in integrating emerging technologies, new models, new testing, remote sensing, and machine learning solutions into practical risk reduction tools. And why do we have to do that? Our profession, the geotechnical profession, not only serves society, we have a role in saving lives in landslide prone regions, just like we have in Norway. And you have examples of recent landslides, not all of them, just a few of them, that were very dangerous. They did not, not all of them caused death, and this was just a fact of chance, but they're all big and they endanger life and cause a lot of damage. The contents of the lectures, I will go through the lessons learned from two recent landslides into last year. And then just mention a few of the emerging technologies that can help reduce risk. And then illustrate with you what we had to do after the big landslide of, in, uh, in December last year as a geotechnical engineer. Then discuss a bit ha landslide hazard and risk assessment and show you a couple of examples of how machine learning models is a new technique. It's innovative. It will help us in both predicting and maybe warn early of landslides. And then finally propose a risk management framework. This is a superposition of a terrain model and LIDAR pictures from the 2020 Yedrim landslide. And what you've seen in newspapers and what I've showed you is this part, is where there were many houses that slid and were transported by the landslide. But the landslide started here. Olmen is a small farm, and I will illustrate for you why it started here. But it started here, and because you were unloading the slope, then it moved upwards, and then all the material flew down along in this river. Tang Elva is a river. So this, it's called the Yedrim landslide. It was over 1 million cubic meter of material moved. It happened nearly on New Year's Eve, and there were 11 fatalities, 31 houses destroyed, 1,600 evacuated, and chaos on road services, infrastructure, and ecosystem. The consequence could have been much worse, but uh, in Norway, most people will go to their cabin to ski during Christmas vacation. So many of the people who were living in those houses were away on that date, December 30th. The retrogression distance was 650 meters and the scarp near over a kilometer long. And the debris spread over two kilometers. It was a thick deposit of marine clay, and in this case, very sensitive quick clay. At Holmen, the location where the landslide occurred started here, Holmen. The factor safety of the slope outside there was very low, like 1.15, but 1.15 is not failing. It was a thick deposit of clay, 
25 meter long and 25 meter high slopes. So this is a warning when we have high slopes and thick deposit of clays, there is a danger of landslide. However, this was not sufficient to explain why the landslide occurred because the slope had been under those conditions already for a long time. So something had to trigger the, the landslide. So if we compare the terrain models and we use LIDAR, the newer technology and uh, uh, tomographies, if we compare the terrain model 2007 to 2015, there was significant erosion downstream. The houses that you saw are, are at the top of the picture. We don't see them. And the initial landslide area is here, Holman. And then in the red zones, there were between zero and three meters of erosion. So, so water or rainfall or block pipes had caused water to erode to, down to a depth of three meters. Now, three meters is a lot. Just imagine that you have <laughs> a, a drain or a, a ditch, which is three meter high. And yet nobody had noticed it. Uh, the area with green, there was accumulation of material, which would have been stabilizing. But in this area, with the low safety factors, these deep erosion uh, ditch were very dangerous. So the, this erosion had been exacerbated by changes in land use in the catchment, urbanization, removal of vegetation, increased the runoff. And the photograph, witness observation, aerial photos, and analysis of the Terrain models documented that the creek that was downstream was had broken out of pipes, and that this probably started already in the late 1990s. Now, the last slide occurred in 2020. The construction of the new building was in 2007. So this, but this erosion dated from even earlier. But it was a bit a distance from the the area. And for agricultural purposes, the creek were laid in pipes. So the stream breaking out of the pipes probably led to increased turbulent flow and erosion. So the creek being blocked also contributed to the, to the erosion. So the conclusion is that several human activities unfortunately acted in the same direction and contributed to increased erosion at the foot of the slope and cause the landslide to start. So if we look at the Yedrim landslide in terms of a risk, and here we're using a very simple risk matrix with the likelihood of a landslide occurring from unlikely, likely to very likely, and with the impact of the landslide from low, medium to high. So early, although it was likely that the landslide could occur, the risk was low, as the landslide would have impacted farmland land only. There were no people living there. And so we were maybe in this position. It was likely there would be a landslide someday, but the, the impact was very low. But urbanization increased the impact. And as many people moved in, then the impact became very high. But urbanization also increased the likelihood of a landslide because its impact on the runoff and erosion in the creek after 2007, when the buildings were constructed. So, and because a large number of people moved in, that made many more people exposed and increased the risk. And the stabilization that was done, that, that was correct for that area where the buildings were. But those measures did not improve the condition at Holman, where the landslide started. Consequently, the risk increased significantly in the area of the new constructions. And for this initial condition, it rapidly increased in the area of high risk. In the same year in June, very far north in Norway, really very far north, there was another big landslide, Alta landslide, but this one did not cause loss of life. It's not an urban area, as you see, and you see part of the landslide here, and then the picture the next day, which was sunnier, 
and then you can see that the landslide has also broken the road here. And all this material move into the water very deep. The Alta landslide was also about a million cubic, meet, uh, cubic meter. There was also a thick deposit of clay, but with interbedded layers of silt and sand. It was an overconsolidated, sensitive part uh, clay, sliding partly in an, in an ancient scar. And we see here the area where the happened. There was an old side, slide scar here, and this is our estimate potential slip plane here, but although the model is not perfect yet. We have marine deposit in blue, and beach deposit in navy blue, and the glacial deposit, mostly sand, in the yellow. And you see they're all kind of layers interbedded here, which perhaps help uh, a, orient the direction of the sliding plane. And the till and bedrock is shown here, although there is some uncertainty about this. The landslide swept eight buildings into the sea, but caused no death, which is very fortunate. It was a flake landslide uh, moving in two directions, as a matter of fact. And it was, in terms of size, it was like the Yerdrim, about a kilometer long, and the scarp was 20 meter high. But what was very interesting, and the tension cracks were observed on the day before. You see there's a gentleman here about two meter high, and here, there's a large crack that we've seen one day before. And this naturally makes me think maybe we should think more of early warning. With respect to causes, it was a, a snow rich, what we call in Norway, snow rich winter. There's not much rain. We, we get the sense of just snow there. But it was certainly not extreme. We've had much worse uh, winters. There was no seismic activity in that area. And we could not find any signs of active erosion. But when we use LIDAR, which is, again is a new technology, it revealed that there had been change in the terrain, which nobody had been informed of. And in some locations, there was some fill as much as two meters, which had been placed in 2015. So what we believe is that the high snow melt, not extreme, but high snow melt in June 2020, that's when our snow melts in Norway, well, it probably led to the highest uh, pore water pressure in the deposit in the area where the new slope with the new fill had been placed. And therefore, the factor safety before, without any pore pressure and a stable pore pressure condition led to a safety factor of 1.15. Mm. So it should not fail. But the increased pore pressure then resulted in a factor safety less than one. So if we look at the risk matrix in this case, the, the potential of a landslide at Alta was always present because there was some sensitive material, the slope was high, and the stratigraphy made the slope sensitive to change in ground water pore pressure through all those sand layers interlayering in the clay. So we had estimated the likelihood of landslide was probably medium. But if there's nobody in the area, then the risk is fairly low. But there were a few people in the area, so medium. And the fill place in 2015 increased the likelihood of the landslide. Furthermore, the, the new house constructed in 2015 increased the number of people living in the area and therefore the potential impact of a landslide. The risk changed from medium to high. With these examples and many others, and you know, we, we've been studying whether the impact of climate change might be there. But it, with this graph here, it, some of you may remember the Lisa landslide where a movie was made while the landslide was occurring. That was in 1978. And we flooded here, we, unfortunately, the number of landslides per year with between about one here, one here and 1.6 here. So it was quite high. When the Lisa landslide occurred, we did a mapping with the tools that were available then, which were not very good. 
the, there were a few uh, cold penetrometer tests and mainly uh, vein shear tests. And then there was an increased awareness with this national mapping, and then the number of landslides decreased. In 2008, you remember there was a financial crisis, and Norway is a rich country, and so to compensate for the crisis, it began many, many infrastructure projects, uh, road construction, tunnel construction, new railways and such. And so this increased investment in the transport and sector to compensate for the financial crisis has resulted in investments which were four times the investment of 2004. And there was much more work done. And all of a sudden, the number of landslides start increasing and it will be much higher now because of the two landslides we had in 2020. So the Norway, the impact of human activity and what I call political strategies may be more significant than the impact of climate change. But we have to remember that water is very often the culprit. We also, we are human beings. There was a very large awareness in these years and then as time goes by, people forget. And then in this time, then people were working and were not considering looking at erosion in the stream and considering po possibility of having soft clay that may slide, etc. So unfortunately, humans have a tendency to forget. Could these landslides have been prevented? But the conclusions were that the risk assessment methodology for a clay area I know is too qualitative and static. Design do not consider change in erosion with time, climatic variation, land use change, or changes due to urbanization. In addition, we have a number of people who do things without asking for permission, and this is also dangerous. So one needs to be very observant. The stability of slopes in clays depends on a combination of material properties, shear stresses, and external factors. Changes to any of these or uncertainty in any of these will impact the slope stability and therefore the risk. The Alta and Yedrim landslides occurred following a long history of erosion and or human activity. New remote sensing technique, as we've seen in, uh, in some of the examples, allow to create digital elevation models with centimeter scale accuracy. And then you can monitor these, what we call aggravating factors, erosion in the river, uh, somebody placing a field without asking for permission, um, uh, somebody digging a hole at the toe of a slope. Um, Innovative and state-of-the-art remote sensing technology should be used to a greater extent to assess changes in risk with time and develop early warning. And there's quite a bit of research being done, not especially on crack appearance, but on animal behavior. And that we see in Norway all the time. And a day or two or three before the land, a landslide, animals behave very differently. And here's an illustration of how risk can change with time and with risk ejection measures and how it will increase without these measures. So here we have a graph of the risk and here you have graph uh, the axis versus time. And let's say that the acceptable risk is at this level here. And let's take a slope like Yedra, maybe it was here. So when you increase construction activities with time, and if you don't do anything to reduce the risk, the risk will continue to increase. And if, if your current risk reduction measures is just ensure looking at the poor pressures or something like that, so that may help decrease the risk a bit. But if you really want to reduce the risk, you have to be proactive and enhance how you will reduce the risk with mapping, monitoring, stabilization, uh, controlled construction activities, codes and guidelines, more research, and preparedness. Now, just one thing, uh, Alta occurred during the day, 
and we had seen cracks before. So, and then the people who saw the cracks warned the others and they went away. Yedrim happened at four, it started at 3.45 in the morning on 30th of December. And those of you who have been to Norway, you know Norway is very, very black. If you don't have snow, you don't see anything. And so once the slide occurred, 345, and then the snow was mixed up with the clay, and it was all black, we could not see anything. I will come back to that. So there were recommendations in the aftermath of the Yadrim tragedy, because when 11 people die, this was a very serious cat catastrophe for Norway. So there were very uh, detailed studies. And we need focus and strict new requirement for construction activities, when it's planned, what is engineered, and how it's controlled. We need to monitor erosion and other tear and change. And then we need to improve procedure for follow-up of alert and citizen report. There had been two citizen reports, but the com community on, on the block uh, culverts or on erosion, and the community did not have the time to, the county, I'm sorry, did not have time to follow up. Uh, and naturally, it's always, there's always a balance uh, how much of the citizen report you will follow. But perhaps more importantly, it was developing a clear division of responsibilities for the developer, the landowner, the contractor, the municipality, and the state. Renewed and improved mapping of quickly areas and enhance hazard mitigation for dwellings and buildings in quick clay. So when you have a lot of people in the area, you should look around a bit further than just the exact area. And then enhancing competence and education, naturally that is always desired. And in fact, the university courses will be changed in terms of these new requirements. I will mention just a few of these emerging technology and then discuss what we did in Yedre. And you know, today <laughs> I am speaking to you from Norway in my, in my living room transformed into an office. It, for me, it's 10, 15, 10, 30 in the morning or so. And, and it's, it's as if I was there. I'm very sorry. I don't get, I will not get to see Nicosia. That was one of the highlights of the, of the conference, but maybe some other time. So everything today is data and communication through data. And then today we generate three-dimensional spatial data with LADAR, with structure from motion devices and with photogrammetry. And we have images from many different passages of satellites and radar and thermal. And to the right, there are just a few examples, very small size. And we can operate from drones or from airplanes, helicopters, or uh, material placed on the ground. And even we operate at 3,000 meter deep water depths in the sea. So radar, the, the different types written here, are all very promising device, as well as li LIDAR, which we use essentially nearly every day now. And it was in 2018, the cover, the cover picture on Time magazine from the US was what's shown here. It's a drone age. Satellites have been operating and collecting data since, since 1972. So those historic, historical data sets are available. And, and our geophysics people at NGI, you know, I, I, tell, I tell them about the job in Hong Kong. And then within two minutes, they have the different maps from the satellites, <laughs> how the area has looked in the past 10, 15 years and how it has changed. And so, you know, this is not a technology I can, but some people do. So it's very quick to obtain how an area has changed with time. So the resolution was not as good in 1980 as it is in as it, it became in 2012. But even now in 2022, it's like 100 times better than what it was in 2012. And naturally, if it's private data, you have to pay for it. But most universities get those data without any without cost. Other than these tearing models, we use uh, INSAR and fiber optics and 
this is an example of the lateral deformation of a tailings dam. And the inset, this area, shows the displacement that are measured. And then you, and then you, you have the scale for the velocity shown here. So when it's red, there are many more movements than when it's blue. And this technology should enable new and unique possibilities for real-time monitoring of change in potential aggravating factors such as erosion. In fact, we have discovered a landslide just occurring in the city of Trondheim. It's about a thousand kilometers north of Oslo, as it was occurring because of INSAR measurements, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Another technology which we have used, but uh, this is for a landslide, but we use it a lot for dams, is uh, fiber optics. And uh, where you have an example here, you have what you call a die test cable used for monitoring ground deformations. And these, this one is to measure the creep along the slope. And how it works is this cable is nice and straight if nothing happens. But if something happens, then you measure a big change in the strain in the cab ca cable. Now, we have a role, not only in design, but all the way through the process when a landslide occurs. So that's what I call gear role after a large landslide. This is the other, um, the houses there. You can see a few houses that failed here. And this is where the debris went. This is a few days after the landslide, it had snowed. So you can see a bit more because of the relief, with the white color. But, but Norway is completely dependent on snow to be able to see during the night. There are two phases after a slide. The, the emergency phase that includes rescue and operation. And then there's a the long-term mitigation phase. And most of us just think about the mitigation phase. But I could give you the real example of Yadrum, what we had to do on the day the failure occurred. So here it's about five or six in the morning. Um, there's a helicopter and it's bringing up a person. You can see you can see it here, the helicopter, and there's a person in black here. Um, there were about 30 people that were saved that you know had been gone down in the landslide and were struggling to stay upright and were on top of a car. Uh, I know it's not this one, we see a car. There's a car here. They were on top of a car or they were on top of some debris. And because the landslide occurred very suddenly and moved a bit, but then it stayed quiet for a little while. So uh, we, we had to go with the helicopter to tell them how dangerous it was. Could they send somebody down and to pick up healthy people? Here there, there's a rescuer and a person being carried up. There were some, some of them were children, so you cannot just lift them by themselves. Or people were afraid of panicking. Now, this picture here, this is the landslide. This, this is not part of picture missing. It's as dark as that. That's what you, you, you cannot see at night. Now, this is during the, there were, the daylight was like, at that time is maybe from 10.30 to 2.30 in the day. So this is the area the next morning. Politi means police because everything is blocked by the police. And here, here because there were the, the people that were rescued that morning until 8 to 10 in the morning were the only people rescued. We did not rescue anybody afterwards. But uh, then the search for people, we, we were hoping perhaps they could be alive. There was a dog that was alive. I think, but we did not find anybody alive afterward. The 11 person missing were in this area. And here's another picture of the scarp and this house, which has been destroyed. And then these were the expression of, of uh, <clears throat> condolence by the people. So in the immediate response after a landslide, we have what we call a field handbook, what we should do in case of uh, floods and landslide. I just put it there in Norwegian to show you it really exists. This was the emergency center on the first day. And the roles we have, the police has the responsibility for the emergency management, rescue, evacuation, traffic regulation, and implementation of immediate measures. They're the boss. But they use people like us 
to help them. Um, the municipality responsible for the infrastructure and the residents uh, and for information to the local community. The government in Norway, it's an outfit called NVA, is an advisor and coordinator technical advice to the municipality and the police. And consulting company like NGI, we are there to assist when they need us. Well, we had three people there for about, it, it, I think it was 15, for 20 days working there full time, day and night. Immediately after the landslide is we have to assess the site and the evacuation procedure to tell them about the soil condition, where we think a new slide may occur, the topography, and associate that with the weather forecast. Is it safe? So, so like, for example, we had the police and ourselves, we were down in the, in the area of the material, and all of a sudden, things started vibrating. And that was a precursor to a new landslide. So then we removed everybody right away. Evaluating the more material moving out, and who should be evacuated. I will give you an example afterward. Can the landslide be a precursor for a larger landslide? Because that we did not know at five o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning whether that was the end of the landsliding. And construction activities elements that can contribute to further landslide, then we have to make sure that we remove all uh, cranes and heavy material who could be the area which could um, increase the danger of a landslide and so and we also have to talk in terms of risk and are there other potential hazards and security measures that could be adopted and what should be monitored under the emergency situation okay if you just wait you will see a landslide occurring i don't know if you'll be able to see it but it, it has been i i can do it once more let's do one Okay, if you just patient for a few seconds, you will see a landslide starting at the top there. Well, this happened in August this year. That was eight months after, and it started by itself. So, so these areas are quite dangerous. It's, it's, it's maybe weather related or uh, drying out and all that, that make uh, a landslide occur. So actually in August, we were working in stabilizing the slopes. We will look at that a bit later. So that was phase one. Phase two is we need to find ways to stabilize the area because this can be reused. Actually, there's a psychological event that uh, aspect that the people are afraid to go back, but they do go back. So the most effective mitigation strategy is a combination that decreases the driving forces and increase the strength of the supporting soil or increase the, the, the toe, and then increase the resisting force in the slope. And the sequence of work execution is of great importance. And I just have an illustration here. This was in the city of Dramen, a fairly big city close to Oslo. And then they just asked us to do an evaluation. And as we were evaluating, we saw so much movement that we immediately without calculation, put this big berm here underwater to prevent these houses and cars from sliding in the river. And I just have a few examples of techniques for mitigating landslides in Norway. And I've just chosen five. Uh, okay, they have bizarre names. Now. But what's important is looking at which mitigation measures were used. And it's always a combination. First, in green, is the reduction of the escarpment height from the top. In purple, soil improvement with vertical drains. In turquoise, soil improvement with live cement. And in orange, stabilizing buttresses. And most often, the mitigation includes the combination of the methods. And I have an example in Yadrum, uh, that this is the scarp. This is drone photo in September 2021, uh, 22, sorry, the typo there. And what we did is we wanted to reduce the driving forces. So we started excavating in stages. 
this would lead, as I mentioned, the reduction of the driving force and increased safety factor. But this has to be done at a fairly safe distance so that the driver here is not in danger. And it's to stop the retrogression process and ensure the safety of the worker. The, the, the landslide I showed you earlier, that was in August, and it was like retrogressing further towards the house that were still there in this area. And this is a landslide in Nittedal, which is close to the airport in Oslo. There was a fairly big landslide as illustrated here. This is water and the material slid out. We used lime cement column, shown in purple. No, no, sorry, that's orange. And buttressing, shown in green, to stabilize the slope after the landslide. So uh, prefabricated vertical drains. Uh, sh it shortened the drainage path, it allows faster consolidation of their load and increase your strength. And we, it, our experience is good with installation down to 30 meters and you design how close they are to each other depending how fast you want the material to consolidate and increase the strength. And typically for us, the distance center to center is one to two meters. And uh, yeah, this filter layer should also be placed and the location is not shown on the figure. Now, a few words uh, on landslide hazard and risk assessment. And our role is to find out which condition can lead to an undes undesirable situation. Will geology, layering, soil properties, the analysis method even give us false uh, results? Or the external actions like rainfall cause another unexpected behavior. And how will we document or reduce the uncertainty in the state of properties? And given this information, which triggers and failure modes are plausible? How often they could happen? I see I'm using a bit of time, so I'm going to skip that and go directly to the approaches today to assess the safety of a slope. You can use the conventional standard-based approach. Or you can use the risk-informed decision-making approach, encouraging a proactive mindset in identifying potential problem areas, required justified reasoning for the choice of the analysis. But this risk-informed decision-making, it recognizes that human judgment plays an important role in decision and that technical information cannot be the only basis for decision-making. So when you do a risk analysis, you will do a site visit. You will find out about geology topography. You will review the information and earlier events that occur. You will check <laughs> with the, whether erosion occurs or not. <clears throat> you will do a brainstorming on, on triggers and failure modes and then describe the uncertainty analysis with probabilistic values and then you then construct a risk diagram and there are many methods that are available a uh, risk matrix that i've shown you i will show you an inventory but there are many other methods today that exist that are all easy to use and then you calculate estimate the probability of the scenarios leading to a failure and here's an example the risk analysis it's this is best carried out by a team in a workshop format and then you can establish the matrix that I've shown before, or you can compare with standards that are used or that are guidelines that are given in many different countries. In this diagram, you have the annual probability of a slope failure as a function of the consequences. In this one, it's the number of fatalities. It could be uh, monies, uh, costs, repair. It could be number of houses, destruction, and such. And in the gray area are all the guidelines that I've offered in about 12 different countries. And then this dotted line is the average that is not an average, but it's the value that's most often used. And it was developed for man-made slopes, as a matter of fact, not natural slope, but man-made slope. Many of the other guidelines were developed for dams. I give you an example here. We will not go into detail. But for example, for a slope, under a rainfall, you will look at what is this deterministic safety factor. Let's say it's 1.15 or less. 
rainfall occurs. You look at the return period of this rainfall and then evaluate the increased pore pressure deformation, whether they are detected and can be mitigated or not. And then this is the yes and no, yes and no for different return period. And then you decide whether landslide will occur and what will be the consequences. I will not go into detail, but these tools exist. And this is for the rainfall. Then you would repeat this for other triggers. For example, uh, people uh, putting a two meter fill or excavating at the toe, um, an earthquake. Uh, or other change condition with time. And then if you analyze each scenario, you will be able to obtain a quantitative value of the failure probability and the consequences. This is, this is a conference on innovation. But I think that machine learning has become a tool which we can very much help us with landslides. And so I just have a few examples to show you a potential. And the first one is using machine learning to determine on-range shear strength. And this is really revolutionary if it works. Normally, one will use a cone penetration test or a piezo cone test, and then run some laboratory tests in the uh, triaxial compression, and then find an NK factor to calculate the on-range shear strength. Here, we took all the clays in Norway, and then we measured the on-range shear strength in the laboratory triaxial compression and uh, these were high quality samples we did not include the samples which were done with poor samplers and such and then we use um, an artificial neural network ann to train the model with the data with 70 percent of the data set and then predicted the unrange shear strength with the rest of the 20 percent and the 45 degree line is the black line. And look, the predicted value are the circles. And the uncertainty, the predicted value is the vertical line. And the prediction is really quite good. And that is without going through an NKT factor. The research is still going on, but it's very promising. You can use also machine learning to predict the spatial distribution of last slides. In 2011, this is in Quam, <laughs> funny name in Norway, um, an area where there were many, many landslides that occurred because of very intense rainfall in August. And here we have a map of the factor safeties as calculated by a deterministic program called Triggers. And let's see, the factor safety less than one are the red areas. These are traditional factor safeties. When we did the machine learning analysis, we tried, we predicted the release area in red, and you know, we predicted the pre release area in green, and then compared it to where landslide had occurred that are shown in red. And you can't see, but where it's black is where no release occurred. It's a black circle as shown here. And this is a busy slide, but these are the same figures as earlier. And we use uh, three different machine learning models, random forest, uh, gradient boosted regression tree, and the multilayer artificial neural network to predict the location, the occurrence of landslide. And we can just look at the accuracy here. These are the three models. And this is the deterministic uh, model, which includes infiltration and does limit equilibrium analysis of the slopes. And the three machine learning predicted within 20, 92 to 95% correctly the landslide that occurred and the landslide that did not occur, whereas the, the numerical model gave, was only 82% precise. We've also used machine learning to predict displacement of a landslide. This is in China, where under rainfall, which is shown in blue, and under reservoir filling and, and uh, lowering in the life of this three gorges dam. There are several landslides that have occurred. And the landslide has developed as shown in green here, stepwise. So I'm not going to go into the details, but in the paper, there will be references to it. But here is the prediction 
the observed value is in blue and the prediction range is between the red and the green and it's not it's it's quite convincing it has a bit of difficulty exactly when it changes from being slower displacement and faster displacement but it's very very consistent so i think these methods are promising so this led us to propose to a framework for doing risk assessment it includes four parts uh, it includes assembling the knowledge required for both deterministic and probabilistic assessment for consequence analysis. It, it has the risk assessment itself, either qualitative or quantitative. Quantitative is also very useful. A, so it does not have to be quantitative. And then the decision making and risk reduction process. And then the, a loop for frequent reassessment of landslide due to global change, demography, urbanization, climate, or if inspections reveal change condition. And this is the framework. It will be found in the paper. And in the green zone is all the preliminary work. And I think what's important here is the experience in the area, the predisposing factor in Norway when it's more than 20 meter high, a slope is more than 20 meter high, has a, a slope greater than one in three, and it has a, a very thick clay deposit, it's a predisposing factor, potential aggravating factor. And for us, naturally, the history, how many landslides have occurred in that area is also a very important information. So in this green area, you accumulate all the area you need. You do the slope stability analysis the traditional way. And then you do in the yellow area this probabilistic analysis of both failure probability and consequence. And then the stakeholder comes in this blue zone and makes decisions based on this risk information, both the traditional information and the probabilistic information, and decides on risk reduction measures, including early warning. And risk communication is important, but I do not have time to talk about this. But this fourth loop here, this regular and frequent reassessment as demography, urbanization, change, as erosion may occur, is probably the most crucial one. Concluding remarks. The safety of workers in neighboring areas can often be the most challenging and can impact the choice of the risk uh, mitigation and rehabilitation technique in the case of an landslide. And the sequence of work execution has to be very carefully planned. Tearing modification in combination with ground improvement drainage method are used as mitigation measures following large landslides in Norway. And soil investigation and new analysis may be needed in order to find the most appropriate risk mitigation strategy. We propose an integrated framework for risk assessment that includes the effect of time if you've done it in year 2010 you can't expect that it's still valid in 2020 in an urban area or even in a forest things have changed and therefore you need to update um, machine learning models can help reduce uncertainties and answer queries rapidly and then one of the most important takeaways in that risk changes with time and the predisposing factors are affected by aggravating factor. So the design should consider changes that may occur or you have to revisit the design quite often. And I guess what's important for the Alta Niedro landslide, it showed that the events occurred following a long history of erosion and or human activity over months and years. Remember, Yedrim may have started in 1990 and it failed in 2020. Whereas Alta maybe was, we believe it was a 2015 construction that was a trigger combined with the snow melt in 2020. But we have seen very good results with LIDAR and INSAR and drone-based photogrammetry to help us establish model and follow how the conditions change. So on this, I thank you very much for your attention. It's not the same as being there, but I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Suzanne Lacasse.
This was an incredible and wonderful lecture and just fitting to the philosophy of the conference, how you have combined every aspect of the emerging technologies. And also uh, you have showed us uh, that was a really eye-opening lecture because you have, show, uh, you have shown us that uh, geotechnical engineering now combines all the aspects of social, political, uh, and technical concerns, and you should be able to foresee what will happen in the future. <laughs> so there, there should be many, many questions that we would like to ask you, but I, unfortunately, we are uh, we finished uh, your, uh, our time. And I think uh, this should be a promise because you were so kind. Uh, although you have many, many responsibilities, you accepted to come personally and uh, we need to listen to you more and more, and we uh, we need to be with you uh, for for a longer duration to uh, uh, to learn uh, your insights. <laughs> and we uh, at this stage, I would like to thank you deeply and sincerely. It was a, such a good and eye opening lecture. Well, thank you very much. It's me who thanks you for giving me this opportunity and. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> and with this wonderful uh, lecture, I close the session one. We will continue with uh, session two. Hello, uh, dear colleagues and guests. Uh, today, uh, we have the privilege of having several uh, keynote lectures uh, here with us, keynote lectures with us. And now I have the privilege of presenting Professor Fum, uh, Fum as a keynote speaker. Uh, uh, hello, Professor uh, Fum, welcome. <laughs> uh, Professor Fum, uh, as you all know, is a worldwide technology authority on statistical and data-driven methods to support decision-making in our field in geotechnical engineering. He is a distinguished professor and vice provost at National University of Singapore. And uh, he is also a professional engineer and past president of the Geotechnical Society of Singapore. And his research interests include statistical characterization of parameters, reliability-based design in geotechnical engineering. Uh, he received more than 10,000 citations and uh, has an age index uh, reaching 50. And he is the recipient of numerous awards, some of which I would like to uh, tell about here. Uh, for example, ASC Norman Medal, uh, National University of Singapore Outstanding Researcher Award, John Booker Medal, Hum Humboldt Research Award, among many. Uh, he is the founding editor of Georisk Journal and board member of uh, ISSMGE and vice president of International Association for Computer Methods and Advances in Geomechanics. And he is an elected fellow of the Academy, uh, Academy of Engineering Singapore. Uh, but of course, this is a condensed summary of Professor Fun's contributions and achievements. Uh, but additionally, I would like to add that I had the opportunity to get to know Professor Poon uh, per personally when he visited my university, Bowles University. It was again a June <laughs> day, uh, four years ago, and I remember uh, still uh, vividly remember his speech on addressing the site challenge in estimation of soil properties, and uh, we all the uh, listeners uh, immensely benefited from that speech. And additionally, I should add that what struck me most was his congenial, warm, and humble personality. Uh, without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Fun uh, for his keynote on the site recognition challenge in data-driven site characterization. And uh, Pro Professor Fun, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, can all of you hear me? Um, is everybody all right? Am I coming through? Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your generous uh, introduction. Uh, indeed, um, the first thing that got me very happy was that I, although it's through a video image, I get to see the faces of all my good friends. And um, the chairperson reminded me of this uh, wonderful visit that I did um, quite a number of years ago. And uh, although I could not, you know, this event has been uh, organized under a fairly challenging uh, condition, but I'm, I'm glad to see it uh, taking off and perhaps uh, uh, next year, uh, I could take time off my job and I could uh, pay another visit to the beautiful countries. Uh, today, I am giving a topic um, on site recognition challenge in data-driven site characterization. Uh, it comes across as a very long title, maybe lots of unfamiliar words, um, but I wanted to maybe share that this is a, a less of a presentation. Uh, to be maybe it's a little bit of a conversation to engage uh, all of you, um, thinking a little bit about um, the future that is likely to be digital. Um, I think uh, my, my, my very good uh, uh, friend and also uh, someone that I respected tremendously, uh, Suzanne, has nicely presented this exciting future uh, at the end of her keynote lecture. Um, so today is about thinking about this, and I thought that site characterization is something that uh, clearly is of interest to both uh, researchers and practitioners. You definitely need to know the site before you can do anything. And that could be a good way for us to start the conversation on um, what, how does this digital uh, future benefits geotechnical engineering? You know, what should we do about it? And 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 I hope this this is something that would be um, very useful to all of you. Um, incidentally, just to share with all of you, I've um, uh, departed from the National University of Singapore, so I'm currently taking up the job of the provost at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And of course, I welcome all of you to visit me. Uh, let me, of course, thank the uh, chairperson. They have been very patient and very kind. Uh, Professor Viaza, uh, uh, very good to see you. And also Professor Kavit, um, haven't seen you all for a few years. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's really an honor. And let me thank uh, Professor Chin, uh, Professor Huang, Professor Zhang, and Professor Tang. They have been uh, my collaborators, and I'm using part of their work uh, in this particular presentation. So uh, credit goes to them. Let me uh, talk uh, in more general terms. Um, this topic about machine learning is gaining more and more interest. And for those of um, us who may not have been following the literature, because it's, it still remains somewhat of, a, I wouldn't say it's a mainstream topic, um, I thought today I could share with you uh, the group of us and the technical communities in ISSMG that are trying to push the boundaries of this uh, research in this direction because uh, we all feel that the potential is very big and um, we should be paying some attention. Uh, perhaps I could start off by this uh, interesting survey that was done by TC304 and um, uh, TC309, TC um, which is also hosted by the uh, NGI. Um, so we basically surveyed um, about 400 odd papers over a time frame from 1970 to uh, 2022. I mean, as you can see quite easily that there wasn't much interest at the very beginning. Um, this All this idea about, about machine learning and, you know, um, only took place really going up uh, seriously, uh, perhaps uh, over the last decade. Um, the increase in interest has been uh, exponential, I would say. I'm sorry, the slide uh, came across a little bit um, distorted, but well, it's enough to show um, this is the analysis of the 400 odd papers. It covers a lot of the topics of the application, covers um, topics that all of you are very familiar with, uh, such as foundation, retaining structures, uh, slopes. Um, you also cover mainly what I would say, the more um, uh, traditional machine learning methods. Um, and so you could talk about the artificial neural network support vector machine. This is what we call supervised uh, learning. And of course, there are new techniques that are emerging. A class that is very important for geotechnical engineering, uh, a lot of interest here is Pearson learning. Um, the key difference here, just to share with all of you, is that at this point in time, most of our geotechnical information do not quite belong to the big data category in other areas. And uh, so that immediately leads to the fact that you need to look at problems with with uncertainty. Uh, that that we felt is a logical way 
And to incorporate uncertainty, quantification, the machine learning, uh, BSN learning is one, one um, a, a very high potential um, so-called methodology. We also had um, the third uh, dialogue. Uh, so this is the third machine learning dialogue, uh, basically hosted by, by TC309. As I've said, that's the big data TC. TC304, that's the RIS TC. And we have a new TC, uh, TC222, on um, basically the uh, building information modeling and digital twin. Again, that is hosted by uh, NGI. So this actually took place virtually last year uh, because we can't meet personally, but you can read the uh, ISSMG bulletin um, if you're interested. That's just a February issue. But just a very quick conclusion, I can just boil it down to four items. Um, at this point in time, the interest is emerging very strongly, but it is emerging, uh, to put it accurately. Uh, it remains a minor topic. Uh, the number of researchers who work in this area is quite small, although again, you know, uh, more and more people are paying attention to this. Uh, many of these, uh, many of these methods, uh, or rather many of these uh, research uh, that are currently conducted uh, focuses on applying uh, methods. Um, and a lot of this application will be will be applications that that is very very familiar to current practice. So these are the four um, items that 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 was essentially discussed in the dialogue. Of course, just as a larger at a larger um, at a larger level, I should say that uh, this is not something unique. It's not something new. It's not even something that's invented by us. Uh, this is partly, as I've said. Um, the industry is moving towards a, a, a digital uh, uh, era, and so this is this is something that civil engineers, like the institution of civil engineers, have started paying a lot into interest in. Uh, what could we do with digital twins, a uh, data-driven technology, and so on and so forth? Um, some of you who are um, uh, connected to the ASC Geo Institute, um, you all may have come across this latest issue. Uh, that was just published in um, uh, July, August last year. And so there's this very interesting uh, uh, Geo Strata magazine that you could look at. Uh, the topic is future of Geo. But again, you could see all these uh, new keywords appearing, machine learning, big data, AI visualization. Um, so I hopefully that will, that will let you all know that this is gaining interest in civil engineering at large. It's not just uh, within our, our geotechnical uh, engineering um, uh, feel. Um, I wanted to to share a, a very nice picture where we stand now, and it's always good to look back a little bit at history. And nowadays, people divide the industrial industrialization era into one point zero, two point zero. Um, we are somewhat in the four point zero era. We can argue, and the European Union recently has articulated the industry five point zero era. Um, where where it is believed that uh, industrialization should not just pay attention to the shareholders, but they should pay attention to the stakeholders. Stakeholders will involve the workers, you involve the society they are serving, you involve the uh, environment. So um, it should not be just purely industrialization for the sake of uh, shareholders and for the sake of economics. Now, where, where do you think we stand? I mean, if I can go all the way back to uh, uh, before the age of uh, electrification you can look at the classical or column and that 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 will come about in the maybe the uh, uh, mechanization uh, era one and of course there's a classic all of you know about the classic text by Tazagi 1925 that, that that was not in english and that that will somehow be related to between um, uh, industry 2.0 and 3.0 and of course we have been the current state of art and state of practice have been very, very, very um, using computers and automation in a very serious way. Uh, this is prevailing in the design offices. And so we could say that we're in 3.0. I'm not sure whether we're in 4.0 now. That's the topic of discussion because 4.0 is talking about data, massive, uh, clever use of data, using data to support decision making and also talking about connectivity. Uh, less we can discuss. So I, I actually thought that uh, with this very brief, uh, somewhat of a historical overview, we can take a step back and ask ourselves, um, firstly, I think we should 
it's important not to just focus on the method uh, because ultimately geotechnical engineers are here to solve a problem and, and it's a problem that 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 would uh, basically benefit uh, human communities. I thought it's useful to think about the agenda and the agenda has to be data centric. Uh, let me talk about that um, later. What do I see as the data centric uh, geotechnics in terms of the agenda? The second question, which is many people are very interested in want to zoom in and that will be taking up quite a bit of my time in this presentation will be what can it actually do, right? I, I did ask the question at the beginning, what will be the benefit uh, of doing all this? And more importantly, if I have a little bit of time, I'll talk about the challenges and there are lots of it, or you can think about them as opportunities. If not, then I'll skip uh, part three and we can leave it to another um, to another time. So I'll just cover the first two. So this is how I'd like to spend the rest of my presentation. Uh, so if I if I may, let me talk about the very big picture. We have all these new methods, um, talking about the importance of data. Uh, how do we view the agenda of um, what I'll call data-centric geotechnics? I'm afraid my slide, for some reason, um, it was meant to be done in animation, um, but it doesn't seem to be working now. Um, I haven't used this system, um, haven't used this new system, so the slide is coming not so uh, well. Um, but but it's all right. Um, essentially, I wanted the question um, whether these data centric uh, geotechnics should be approached with the angle of methods first. In other words, we focus on a method, um, and then we start asking ourselves what the method could do for practice. Um, the purpose of this slide was to show you that I actually thought that it's better to think about it as data first, uh, because this is what the major change is between industry 3.0 and 4.0. So if we think about data first, if you look at my, you look at the left of the slide, then immediately will lead you to the fact that you have to deal with real data, whatever it is, whatever shape it is, however much you have and the quality. Uh, so the attribute is very important. Uh, not to ignore it and make assumption that you have lots of data, for example. You also need to think about the context because to me, all our data comes from a physical origin. Uh, so we should not be thinking about data as just pure abstract numbers. I think that that would not quite fit our needs. Um, I also thought that uh, since this whole idea about thinking about, uh, dig uh, about a digital future, about data-centric geotechnics, is all about trying to align our profession to industry 4.0, 5.0. So the word is industry. And therefore our research has to be taking, putting practice on a, on a, on a, on a central uh, platform. And again, if we think about practice as a central platform, then that will lead us to the fact that we should be looking at real projects. Uh, we need to look at whether any of the things we are doing are make sense in terms of the cost in terms of the time needed to conduct that analysis. And of course, more importantly, uh, uh, how does it add value to, to practice? Uh? And practice in this case, I divide into two. Uh, one, how does it contribute to existing practice? We've got lots of lots of uh, challenges, even in existing practice. The second part to it is that how do you change practice? That's changing the game. Uh, that, that is not known. Uh, I, I have no clarity on that at this point in time. But just quickly to share with the entire audience, because that's my favorite question. Whenever I give a talk and people say, you know, Prof Pone, there's no data. Um, I would like to say that uh, TC304 has been building a, a platform to share data publicly uh, because we understood the importance of data, both for RIS and also for um, a, a future kind of development of uh, new methods. And so uh, the, the technical committee uh, 304 has started this since 2017. And uh, lots of people have contributed their database. These are real data from real projects. And so um, I would certainly like to, like to um, uh, say that if you want to do research in this area, you can at least get some real data sets of significant sizes to try your hand on. Um, so it's not a it's not an impediment for you to start research in this area or to explore this area. So um, I started off by thinking, or rather we started off by thinking about data and then we think about how data can inform decision, nothing new. This is what we have always been using and thinking about. 
And then we need to think about what are the ways that data can inform decision. And one of the really, really powerful tools, by the way, would be our human brain. Uh, let's not ignore that the human has a very powerful brain. Um, some of you will be wondering uh, what is so powerful about a human brain. Um, let me show you this uh, technique called semantic uh, segmentation. Some of you will be wondering what it, in the world it is. You look at the photograph on the left. Huh? I bet I bet that among everyone who is listening to me now, it took you less than a second looking at this picture to immediately conclude that it's a photo of a street, busy street, people walking around, cars, buildings, signboards. Uh, it takes you, it takes you, I don't know what's the time, but less than a second. Uh, but just to share with you, semantic segmentation is one of the hottest area in computer science now. Um, none of us are working in this area. Uh, but this is a very, very difficult area. State of the art, um, just getting a machine learning to understand which part of the photo is a car, which part is a human being. In other words, a seeking meaning in a picture. A picture is ultimately just a set of pixels. I'm sure all of you know that. Just a dot, just a number. Finding meaning from a photo and a pixel is actually very difficult. Uh, and yet it doesn't... Um, Yes, there's no challenge to the human brain. The human brain is very efficient in certain ways, uh, in other words. And so um, the idea that human judgment is important is not just to say it for, just to say it as, as a, um, uh, 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 without any evidence. Of course, the other thing that human brain is not very good. Again, this was meant to be an emanation, but it didn't quite work out. It's my favorite picture in the movie Matrix. Well, you got all these uh, symbols uh, coming to you live. Uh, this is a very famous uh, picture called a coat, coat rain. Um, and again, you know, I, I, would, I would ask the, 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 the people who are watching this uh, uh, presentation at this point in time to imagine these numbers coming to you live, real time. I, I would think it's very, very difficult for us to make sense of this symbol. What does it mean? And, and, and a mediation by... Uh, an algorithm to let us know what it says, uh, I would think is almost necessary. I, I don't think any human being could make sense uh, of this picture. So you can see the deep contrast, uh, what the human brain could do and could not do. A, what about a model? Uh, maybe I should have written this slide better. Uh, I should be talking about physical model. And of course, the most, phys the most, the most commonly used physical model nowadays in, um, in, in practice and in design offices, even among um, uh, uh, us, is to use a finite model. You know, a finite model is a model that can calculate and solve really complex uh, uh, problems. And I'm just showing you a 3D example, um, and all of us are doing it. But I want to I want to make a comment here that may not be well appreciated. A finite element model has two things. A physical model, sorry, a physical model has two things that are extremely powerful. One. Um, just using a few clever numbers. In this case, I'm, I'm using our favorite uh, Young's modular small column model, right? CV. One um, parameter governing deformation, one parameter governing strength. Just using these three clever numbers, huh? uh, uh, and let's not talk about sophist more sophisticated uh, uh, soil models. I can actually calculate the deformation of the tunnel. I can calculate the uh, capacity of your pulse and and all these wonderful things that we do. In other words, I'm very, very efficient in terms of using um, information. I don't need a lot of data, uh, leaving aside the spatial variation and complexity of. I can get some first order feel for the soil structural interaction. It's very clever. Secondly, uh, that one is really well appreciated, but, but, but I need to emphasize it. A physical model has generality beyond the numbers that you are giving it. So the Young's modulus, the CV are just inputs to this physical model. It doesn't, it doesn't control the generality of this uh, model. The generality is controlled by the physics. I would safely say that at this point in time, physics is the most general. That means you can, you can kind of like have some confidence in using it for unknown circumstances because the physics are uh, uh, physics is governing the behavior at a very deep level. Uh, useful. You need to think about that. And of course, the last one is data-driven, uh, the topic uh, that I'm discussing today. So exactly what it is, you know. 
uh, it processes number in a very abstract way. Um, and, and this is one way I can show you because there's something not even in the research paper. It's part of our research discussion. Uh, just to show you the kind of pictures that we share with each other. Um, so this picture actually tells you the, uh, uh, for example, it shows you the distribution of the mean and standard deviation of the cone tip resistance at different sites. The blue dots represents uh, clay sites all over the world. The orange uh, dots represents the uh, sites at Shanghai. So Shanghai is just a small part. The blue part is very generic. We are looking at the mean and standard deviation at every site. We are looking at see whether the mean and standard deviation of the cone tip resistance, are they, are they different between Shanghai and the rest of the world? Of course, we do that for the normalized undrained strength. We also compare mean and standard deviation. I, I think you're getting the picture. These are very abstract statistical concepts. Uh, we are looking at actually uh, whether there are any site differences. I think you could see that. Um, interestingly enough, uh, let me jump to the conclusion before I show you my results. Interestingly, doing all this abstract mathematical uh, manipulation, you can get good insights. But not easy for the engineers to relate to because they are not physics. So I hope I gave you a very good, um, or at least a, a rough uh, understanding, a rough appreciation of this idea about data-centric geotechnics, where you think data could be very useful, where you think it may have problems, and um, whether is it correct that we should focus more on data and on, on the problem first uh, before worrying about the method. Uh, so uh, very quickly, if I could uh, take up another um, 10 odd minutes of your time, why don't I zoom down to the next level and talk about site characterization and ask ourselves, uh, let's assume that now we're going to go in the direction of data driven and you know, just look at data as data. Uh, how far can we do and what, what kind of insights can we get if we pursue uh, this direction of our reasoning? Um, we have already published paper in, uh, this paper just came out this year. Uh, we talked about challenges, we talked what could be done. So my, my, my presentation is based on this paper. Um, the exact methodology was published in another paper. Um, uh, so we call this project, uh, projective geo, uh, where we're using purely data-driven technique to actually uh, characterize a 3D subsurface, uh, which can be very complicated as shown in the graphics. It doesn't have to be horizontal layers. Uh, that, that is not, that's not interesting enough to stretch the ability of data-driven techniques. Uh, if you try to use conventional technique to characterize a spatially variable and heterogeneous soil mass like the picture in this slide, uh, I would think that you find it very challenging. So to go back to the, um, the, the challenges involved in a data-driven site characterization, um, there are at least three, there are more, uh, but I wouldn't have enough time to talk about that. So I'm going to talk about number one, and number two, just to talk about what is the meaning of ugly data. And of course, that will lead to uh, what we want to do for site recognition. Uh, but even before I start to talk about ugly data, I need to, I need to um, perhaps uh, emphasize an obvious point uh, to everyone in the audience that firstly, our data is safe. And secondly, our data comes from a physical context, a physical scenario. Um, I show you this picture of a cone penetration uh, rig uh, from uh, fin uh, Finland. Uh, yeah, because I'm from Singapore, as all of you know, I'm based in, and I find fascinating that uh, we can do this test in winter in the middle of the snow. So that uh, picture came from team uh, Temporary University. Um, Let's, let's look at the data set uh, that I got from Shanghai, uh, a piece of work that we did uh, uh, two years ago. And there's nothing special about Shanghai data. I just took it, um, you know, uh, as an illustration. And on the right side, um, note, note that my scale is 50 meters. And this represents roughly the size of a subway station in, in, in Shanghai. And it's the, the size of a subway station is not any different from subway station, I'm sure, in any other cities in the world. This gives you a sense of the site. This gives you a sense of the kind of things that we do. You know, take borehole, venture test, cone penetration test. It gives you a sense that you don't have a lot. And the, the data is quite sparse. That's always well known. 
Um, on the left, uh, you can see uh, a larger picture, a zoom out. Uh, you could see that my sites I actually arranged along a linear trajectory because this is a subway line. Uh, um, so I'm taking data at different stations along this uh, uh, subway line. It's actually line, uh, line 13 and line 2 uh, in the city of Shanghai. Of course, if you were to take all your site data, you compile them into a database, you have a lot of data. Uh, no doubt, but you, you already begin to see that this data belongs to a different site and uh, some of the engineers will be wondering whether one site can be used for another site. So you're now getting close to the uh, key theme of my talk. Um, I call this, uh, we call this indirect data. We want to emphasize, because this is all our data that we're interested in geotechnical, we want to emphasize indirect uh, because all engineers are interested in one site. You make decision for a single site one particular station. You want to use information from other sites, but, but put, as an engineer, you would do it with some degree of a um, care, uh, simply because our sites are different. So I call it indirect because it doesn't directly, it should not anyway, directly uh, uh, impact your decision at one site without some degree of um, uh, interpretation. And again, um, just to make sure that we are very concrete here, I show you an example of a real site investigation uh, table. So again, there's nothing unusual. Um, you do a number of tests, you know, your water content, your 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 plasticity limit test, your unrinsure strength, your cone penetration test, fuel test. You do it at different depth. Um, some of the more expensive tests, you do less of it. Uh, the inexpensive tests like the CPT that you can penetrate and collect data, say every uh, two centimeters, you can do more. Um, so if you draw a table, then you're going to get all these uh, uh, blue boxes. And these blue boxes means that they are the location they did not measure. You know, so your, your table would be multiple columns, represent multiple tests, and your table would be... Um, have uh, blue boxes representing that they are they are not complete or incomplete. Um, we we summarize these attributes which we think are a set of attributes that all machine learning methods that we wish to develop in geotechnical engineering for site characterization. We think that you need to do it. You need to consider it as a starting point. So it's not even like a future thing, but you need to look at it now in order to demonstrate the usefulness of whatever technique you wish to bring to the table. Uh, because your site characterization report that you're getting now in practice looks like the table that I just shown you. You don't get a simpler table. This is what you have. And these are the valuable information that you have. So it has many columns because you do different tests. So it's multivariate. Um, I don't have to talk about uncertainty. Uh, the uniqueness is very interesting. Uniqueness means that we don't expect every site to be identical. Uh, sparsity, I think I just shown you. One subway station, how many boreholes and tests do you have? Incomplete, I've shown you. The tables are incomplete, right? You've got all these uh, incomplete um, cells colored in blue. Um, I haven't thought about data that is bad or corrupted. Uh, but if the database is big enough, one expects some of these data pieces to be maybe not, um, uh, maybe they are human errors, for example. And of course, um, because of our geologic origin of our data, you expect the data to be specially variable. And then going back to the fact that um, you want to attack a problem in practice, um, then intrinsically your, your site that you're trying to characterize has to be 3D. Uh, this is this is your starting point. It's not the end point of a 10-year research. It's need, something you need to do now. And this is actually very challenging. Uh, without talking about... Uh, technically, it's a very challenging problem. But we thought we should attack it. Uh. Uh, just to show a little bit about what is the meaning of a uh, site uniqueness, I, I just drew some simple uh, plots that all of you are familiar with. So this is a simple plot uh, showing how the... Um, uh, a normalized unrinsure strength um, uh, changes with the vertical effective stress. The gray dots represents a generic database. Uh, the sites are all over the world. The triangle represents the um, 
sites and the data from Shanghai. You notice that the Shanghai information, I, I think this is obvious to many of the um, all of you, the Shanghai data doesn't occupy the same space as the gray dots. It just occupy a sub part. Um, it, it is not, uh, more importantly, you notice that the um, Shanghai data is not, is not distinct from the big, uh, gray, uh, big uh, gray uh, scatter plot for the generic data set. It's actually part of the generic data set, uh, but it represents a, a more, um, a less scattered uh, portion of it. So this is the kind of common uniqueness that we see like, in many, many of our databases. We've done a lot of this for sure, not, not just for this um, uh, data. Um, unfortunately, the animation is not working. Um, so maybe I'll skip this slide uh, because this slide has a lot of animation. So uh, maybe I, let me uh, quickly get down to the uh, last part of my presentation, which is the uh, site recognition. We call it site recognition because there's there's a bit of an analogy with facial recognition. This is being used uh, even in some of your offices. You could probably see the power of facial recognition. Every individual has somewhat different phases, but the algorithm is clever enough to, to kind of detect these distinct differences by looking for features, which is what we hope to do. Uh, we hope to replicate. L let me let me talk about the 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 problem statement for site recognition in a in a way that you know without going through the maths or without uh, looking at the machine uh, learning algorithm, but just to show you conceptually what is the problem we are trying to attack. Um, and then we are using a problem that again everyone is familiar with, so it's easy for all of you to relate. This is just a correlation. Um, you have a design parameter, it could be undrinchial strength, you've got a few tests, it could be the comb penetration test. You're trying to use a comb penetration test to estimate the undrinchial strength. You can't do that with 100% precision, everybody knows that. The standard method is for you to just collect information from as many sites as you could, and then to draw a regression line. So it's somewhat this picture. The color dots is to tell you that the data come from different sites. Uh, just to emphasize that this is not from a single site. And, and there could be heterogeneity. Uh, the dash line represents the 95% confidence interval. So you can, for those of you who do not understand this concept, you can just take it that this represents the uh, uncertainty. When you make a prediction uh, using the regression um, line, which is the solid line in the middle, uh, that is only the so-called the mean line. It doesn't it doesn't include the fact that the answer could fluctuate between the dash line. So this is this is somewhat um, a standard practice that we are doing now, based on combining information from many different sites. Of course, um, you can think about the fact that I'm only interested in my site. I'm not interested in other sites. You want to just use information from your site. So let's say we use the red dot, like site A. But the problem is that by doing that immediately, you notice that the number of data, number of data points drop tremendously. So your uncertainty increases. Whenever you reduce information, you get less precision. But um, you get maybe a more, a better um, estimation, uh, perhaps in the sense that it, it reflects the site bias because you notice that the gradient of the solid line has changed. In fact, I just show a few slides, for example, different sites will have different gradient. They, they will not follow the generic uh, correlation uh, model. And this, this is something, although it's a picture for illustration, we've done a lot and a lot of such analysis. And so this general observation that all engineers would know anyway, uh, we are just providing lots of statistical evidence to say that the engineers are right. Small data, you are very interested in it, but it's not enough to establish a highly precise model. You have, you can get a lot of data by combining with a lot of sites, but then you're not sure whether you apply to your site. So whether you use the big data or small data, uh, there are limitations based on our current state of the art. Uh, again, this was meant to be animation, it's not working out now, but um, I'll just briefly mention what this slide is meant to show. The idea now is that, is number one, if you use the uh, big data, which is the pink dots, all right, looking at the pink dots, uh, lots of it, um, 
you get this uh, generic uh, correlation. Uh, and then if you were to add in your local site, let's say you have a new site, you add in the orange points, so that there are four orange points here, you add it in. Let's assume that you throw your orange point to the this giant uh, database of red dots. Um, I think common sense will tell you that the four orange dots will be totally swarm. Uh. That means your side effect is totally gone. Then you, you do a regression, you end up with almost the same line. So your answer is still what we call a generic correlation. It's not, it's not local, it's not site specific. But if you, have, if you have a clever way that you have a machine learning technique and your machine learning technique can actually identify uh, within your big databases, they can identify sites that are so-called similar to your site. So instead of doing an indiscriminate addition of all the data into a giant database, you carefully select. Actually, this is something that engineers do uh, because they are familiar with their local site. Um, so the engineers are very clever in doing it. But of course, engineers has a limitation. Your, your, your experience base doesn't en encompass the whole planet. And so if I give you data from other parts of the world, you have a hard time selecting. So if you have a machine learning code that can do that, then it has access to access and it can dis discriminate even a larger database. Well, that's our aspiration uh, in a simple way. That's the meaning of site recognition. Uh, easy for me to explain, but actually, can we do it? You know, that, that, that is the key question uh, in, this, um, in this discussion. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, just talk about big indirect data. Um, I did mention that we've been doing it. In fact, one of the examples uh, that I've been showing in this big data set uh, highlighted by the, by the red box. So it's a fairly big uh, clay data site with 7,000 7, uh, odd uh, records all over the world, by the way, not one single site. And um, it distinguishes from other databases because it's multivariate. There are like 10, 10 separate soil parameters. Uh, so it's a very big, uh, it's a very, for geotechnical engineering purposes, it's a very big uh, data, data table. Um, we are not the only one doing it. Like, there are other people also uh, starting um, this important work of collecting database because this forms the foundation for future work. And we have um, data from Finland. So there are some national, some Sweden, some Shanghai within a city municipal. So there are different scales. Uh. Uh, in recent uh, years, so this is done basically maybe over the past two, three years, I've started correcting a rock mass information. Uh, this is an interesting area, incidentally. For those of you who are interested, um, we have hardly any uh, researchers working in this area, but rock mass is an important problem. In fact, it's even more complex than soy, uh, based on my argument. And we need more people to work in that. Uh, recently, we have started collecting data on the um, on the C sub C, the compression index. Um, but you could see that there are lots of data. So this idea about big indirect data exists. If you're interested, go to the TC304 website. It actually provides database such as the one that I'm showing to you uh, in detail. Um, we have also started collecting load test databases and they are fairly big. Since load tests are more expensive than just collecting a soil parameter, um, we have collected data for all kinds of foundation, a shallow foundation, you know, offshore spot can, driven power, rock socket piles, uh, helical piles. So whatever we can get our hands on, we just simply collect and we compile. Of course, we, we, we carefully um, uh, screen the data sets to make sure that they're all good. And then we kind of like put them together in a nice table so that all future researchers could use. Um, this has been published into a book. So that gives a sense of the amount of data we have. It's a real book, it's not a paper. Uh, let me skip this, but a sense that uh, the rate, uh, the rate numbers you are seeing on my, on my slides represents the number of records that we have. And as I've said, if you are looking at um, load test database, this is quite big. Huh? So you, you, you have other, you have soil data, your load test data. Actually, you also have um, liquefaction data um, and, and all this information is available on the TC304 website. So I will not um, talk more about it. And maybe if I could uh, spend the next uh, 10 minutes, I talk about the methods. Uh. 
now that I hope you are clear about the technical challenge, uh, what we hope to solve, um, I present a variety of methods that we have been developed over the past five years. Um, the idea here is not to talk about this table. The table is to is to is to share basically three observations. Uh, so I will get you to focus on the first line. That's the line in blue. Um, that's the regression uh, method. So this is the standard method. In the standard method, uh, you have a generic population. Looking at my second column. And then you have a site population. That's what you measure at your one site. Um, and then the assumption in, in the standard regression is that your site population, your generic population are the same. So I label them as A. And then you, you, you just do your regression. Um, this is something we're all familiar with. The next um, five methods um, are all methods of increasing sophistication and they're all meant to attack two questions um, and this refers to the last column so I, I refer you to the last two column uh, one column is called site uniqueness one column is called explainable uh, let me let me say what it means site uniqueness will be that that problem i just mentioned are you able to detect that every site are somewhat different and then you can actually quantify their difference so that if they are not so different, you put them together. If they are very different, you, you have a way of rejecting them. Uh, then when you do the regression, the regression would be somewhat, I wouldn't say it's a perfect a local, I wouldn't say it's a site-specific correlation, but maybe we call it a quasi-site-specific. That means it is close to a site-specific, but not fully based on site-specific data. I will, I will run through results for some of these methods uh, just to illustrate to you all the strength and the limitation of this method. The second important, so the third conclusion, which is the last column of this table is explainable. Explainable is an interesting um, attribute. We are now asking ourselves, um, uh, since the majority of the machine learning algorithms are what we call black box, black box means that it produces an answer, you scratch your head, you don't know where the answer you know, the answer is good or bad. What is the basis for the answer? You do not know, right? Um, so engineers have a hard time. If you talk about using engineering judgment to the importance of engineering judgment, then it's very hard. How do you connect the engineer to the to the uh, machine learning algorithm? Ideally, you want your, your insights to be explainable. Note that this is not a problem for physics. Huh? You run finite element, I look at the mechanism, I look at the physics, I can relate. It is a big problem for machine learning because there's no there's no physics. Uh, so again, this is this is this this has um you know this uh, this uh, this particular slide has animation. Um, so so sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This is just to show an answer for some standard correlation using that generic database, the one that I told you, the large one, you know, 7,000 odd records. We just throw all the data together. We plot the correlation. Um, you could see quite easily that the uh, the correlation, the scatter is very big. Anyway, I'll show it to you later. I got more graph in this. Um, they just keep repeating this example. Um, so let me now uh, use a site in Taipei. So this is a real site, real table. I'm now interested to develop a local correlation for this Taipei site. So that's my objective. But my Taipei site that I have um, is not a lot. There's only like nine records, you could see, nine rows. Um, and then some of the numbers are missing. And these are again the, the blue, the blue uh, empty cell. Um, I also have rows that are pink. The pink rows represents my training set. So in machine learning, you always have to identify part of the database as training. So you train the algorithm based on these um, numbers, and then you reserve part of the table for validation. So the ping one represents training. So once you, you do that, immediately you notice that your training set is even, you've got even less, uh, you've got even got less data for training. So uh, let me just go through uh, these uh, results that we have been working on. I, as I said, over the past three years. 
Um, the blue dots, remember, represents the generic correlation. So these blue dots are like all over the world. You throw them into the plot. You notice that the scatter is quite big, uh, as I already said, uh, and it's to be expected. Um, what we did, the red dots represents the actual data in Taipei. So these are measured data, nothing to do with machine learning. The gray dot represents numbers that we generate using BSN machine learning. So if we use BSN machine learning, I won't explain the method. Um, if you use that red dots as your training, I can generate the gray dots. Uh. So the gray dots are basically dots that the machine learning things that belongs to your Taipei site. You notice that the firstly there's a big change, you know, in the in the scatter of the of the uh, data. You notice that there's a big difference between the blue dots and the gray dots, particularly for the last two plots, uh, uh, which is actually your undrenched strength versus um, uh, vertical effective stress, undrenched strength versus uh, normalized quantitative resistance. The impact immediately without doing anything is that if you if you can do that, then you can select less conservative um, because the, the impact of having a large uh, uncertainty is that the moment you select your characteristics value or a cautious estimate, you have to go very low if your uncertainty is very large. Uh. If your uncertainty is smaller, you can select a less conservative uh, so-called cautious estimate. You look at my first plot. My first plot represents the pre-consolidation stress uh, versus the liquidity index. You notice that my gray dot and my blue dot are not too different. In fact, my gray dot could be worse. The reason is that you only have three. I mean, go back to the table. You look at the third last column, which is sigma p prime, the pre consolidation the pre-consolidation stress. You notice that in this case, you have only run a three edometer test. Very few, but this is not uncommon. So I think the result is reasonable. You've got only three data, you don't expect to learn a lot. Um, I plot, I now I plot the data at a higher resolution scale. This is only taking one correlation, which is the strength versus the normalized contact resistance. The red dot represents the measured measured results I use for training. Okay. The uh, hollow, the hollow uh dots represents the generic data. So that gives you a sense of 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 what you would get if you follow a conventional technique. Now, if you take the red dot, you throw it together with the hollow dots with no site, with no site uniqueness um, included in analysis, um, you will end up with um, results that you see on the right screen. Uh, let me uh, explain what the right screen means. The vertical bar represents your predicted 95% confidence interval. So if you ask the model, what is the uh, predicted uh, range of uh, undrenched strength for a given normalized quantitative resistance that give you a vertical bar. So the vertical bar tells you the precision of your estimate, which in this case is quite big, la, as you could see from my red bracket. The yellow dots, by the way, represents the actual measurement made. So the yellow dot represents the validation. Uh, if your machine learning code is correct, your yellow dot must fall inside the bar. If it falls outside the bar, that means your method is incorrect. La. Um, so this validation process is part and parcel of any machine learning. Uh, so there's no, it's quite uh, scientific and quite rigorous. Uh. Anyway, this method is not invented by us. This is a standard uh, method for developing machine learning algorithm. So um, red dot training, yellow dot validation. Vertical bar is my estimate or my prediction. So this is what you get uh, if you do not consider side differences. Um, a while back, uh, about two or three years ago, we invented what we call a hybrid method, where what we did was that we take the generic solution, we multiply by the site-specific solution. So this is somewhat of an ad hoc approach. Uh, there's not much science in it, but it's kind of reasonable. If you follow what we call a hybrid approach, um, you will get the black dots uh, instead of the gray dots. Remember, the gray dots are the site-specific Bayesian learning solution. The blue dot is your generic solution. Your black dot will be using the hybrid approach will be the best estimate for the Taipei site. Um, I think the comparison with Bayesian machine learning is somewhat similar. Maybe you get a little bit of an improvement for your first plot where the scatter is very big. 
because you only got three data points, remember? So if you focus on the range uh, within the two vertical bar, because the training set, remember the training set only span the narrow range of the quantitative resistance. So let's just look at that, that, that range. That is the interpolation range. If you look at the diagram on the right, um, you immediately see that uh, the hybrid approach is actually uh, very useful because you notice that the uncertainty has dropped significantly. I hope you all could see. Maybe I do a quick one. This is the uncertainty using the standard regression. This is the uncertainty if you were to use the hybrid method. The change in the, the drop or the increase in the precision is quite noticeable. Um, so it's a useful technique. Um, you can also think about what would be the answer if you're outside the range of the training set. That's the extrapolation, right? That's the set, the larger, the larger part of the graph marked with the arrow extrapolate. Uh, interesting. Uh, we haven't actually validated whether this extrapolation is um is valid. Uh, strictly speaking, for all machine learning code, you only work within the interpolated zone. But we're interested to find whether there are methods they are more robust for extrapolation. That was um so this is not a, this is just a study, or rather that's just an initiation of our study to study the generality of machine learning. Our most recent approach is the hierarchical Bayesian model. So this is a very, very powerful method. And, and this has scientific basis. In fact, it's widely used in machine learning in, in all areas, not just geotechnical area. And uh, we are pleasantly surprised that even with only three, with only three data points, again, let me focus your attention on the leftmost plot. With only three data points, uh, if you all pay attention, the original Bayesian machine learning are the gray dots, a big scatter. But the hierarchical Bayesian model can actually reduce the uncertainty even for three. The reason is that the hierarchical Bayesian model can actually draw information in a selective way from the blue dots. So hierarchical Bayesian model can selectively identify blue dots that are relevant to the type A site and learn from it. So that allows it to reduce the uncertainty. Uh, I think it's very promising. We've been using it for different data sets um, and we found that uh, so far it has been uh, uh, performing rather well. Uh, maybe I could just uh, talk about the last method. Um, so now we are trying to extend the hierarchical Bayesian model because the theoretical basis is very strong and we want to look into the concept of explainability, which I said is very important. So instead of the hierarchical Bayesian model producing an answer for us and say, you know, uh, this is the answer. By the way, the answer basically is the uh, vertical bar, the predicted range of answers. Um, and the engineer can either accept or not accept, although the engineer could validate, but other than that, no other insights possible. We are now doing um, a new method uh, based on the hierarchical Bayesian model as a theoretical basis. We are now getting the machine learning code to identify the sites that they think are similar. So these are the rectangles. Uh, apologies. These are the triangles, the green triangles. The three green triangles are the sites that are identified by hierarchical, hierarchical Bayesian model that they feel is similar to the Taipei site. Um, and then using this green, using these green dots, they combine the red dots, they produce the so-called the prediction on the right. So now you have a vertical bar predicted with a knowledge, explicit knowledge of what similar sites are. Interestingly, we found that the precision drop. You notice that the bar is now taller. Uh, the method is valid because the yellow dots, the validation dots fall onto my vertical bar is valid. But you notice that the bar has gotten taller, less precise. This hierarchical Bayesian model with no explainability. We try to explain now we got a loss of precision. We are trying to figure out why. Um, we are hoping it's not a trade-off. Uh. So maybe, maybe the method can be improved. Uh. Uh, as I said, these are just research that we are doing uh, over the past few months. So you are seeing our our live research that's ongoing. Of course, we also try to avoid cheating. Uh, we plot the chart on Casa Grande to see how the green dots appear on the uh, Casa Grande chart. And we notice that uh, some of it looks like it cluster around the red dots. Red dots are the actual measurements, by the way. But there are green dots that are far away on the Chris Grander chart. 
So maybe the similarity uh, is not so similar. Uh, we need deeper investigation. I am only, I, I think I ran out of time. La. Maybe what I could do is I'll just stop here. If I could, uh, maybe I jump to one slide. Uh, again, this paper has been published. I wanted to say something that connects to Suzanne's uh, excellent point about using some of this machine learning for risk analysis and also for, um, uh, you know, uh, connecting to her presentation because it talked about data from satellite and drones. Uh. I wanted us to, at least that's the way we are proposing it, uh, that if we have such powerful method, uh, why don't we use it for such application where conventional method doesn't quite work well? Uh, we call this a uh, method a uh, type 2b just to share with you the proposal type 2b are methods where you use emerging data new data and we combine that with existing method that that they are really very powerful um so um this is just to connect to uh, suzanne's uh, very interesting uh presentation on um risk analysis I also want to say that there's a type 2a uh, that was actually what i presented just now where you have used available site data we are not thinking we're going to get more, but in the future we get more, we'll, we'll, we'll adjust the technique accordingly. But then we, we actually develop new novel machine learning techniques to get even more uh, insights from our, what we think to be very limited uh, data, but I'm hoping to convince you it's not limited because we are getting exciting answers out of it. We call it type 2A. I, we are postulating there's a type 3 where Everything is new, but none of us know what exactly it is. So why don't we call it type three? But no idea. Uh, but if things were to work well, we should go into type three. So maybe I stop here. Uh, there'll be a special issue coming next year for those of you who are interested. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Foon, for this uh, mind-opening uh, presentation. And uh, it's like a glimpse for us uh, into the future. Uh, Professor Atalar, can we take any questions from the audience? Or do we all uh, Usually, they send their questions. First of all, uh, Professor Foon, uh, I enjoyed it as much as I did four years ago when you went to Boazici uh, and uh, thanks uh, Özer, which he invited me to listen to you. Uh, so it's been a wonderful uh, lecture. I'm sure that uh, the ones which they listen or they are going to watch it on the YouTube, they will be very bene beneficial. Uh, now uh, I'll just check if they send any questions because we got it like a moderator to ask the questions. We will pass it to uh, uh, Professor Chinigiolo. Uh, I'm just checking. Uh, okay. Although I'm here, I'm in another room with the, we got three or four rooms. There is no questions. Thank uh, you. It's a question. Small question. <laughs> it was so good that they, everything is clear. <laughs> Thank you. So, so happy to see you, uh, Professor Kavit. So happy to see you. Happy to see you as well. I hope one day we come together again. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to... Either I'm going to, in Singapore uh, or in Istanbul or in Lefkosha. That's correct. That's correct. I'm going to take a holiday for sure. <laughs> yes. I was... I stayed for five hours in Singapore, but it was night time, so I couldn't meet you when I was going to Australia. Oh, uh, all right. All right. No worries. Uh, yes. So next time I, I come to your university. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you again. Professor yes, Fung, it's always a privilege and pleasure to listen to you. We are learning to, uh, very much from your lectures and hope to see you in the future in other parts of the world because uh, after this pandemic, we uh, couldn't meet each other. 
Hope to see you soon. Thank you for very much for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just ask them if we can take a, a picture of us to put it uh, on. Alan, can you take a, a picture from? Okay, go on. Yes. But... Okay, we took the picture. Thank you very much. I will send it to Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Fun. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, Azar. It was very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Atalar. Uh, with this, I am closing the session and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. The next session is going to be chaired by Professor Kutay Özaydın and Professor Tuncer Edil is going to present his keynote lecture. Wow, we are all on. <laughs> okay. We didn't believe that we would be, but... <laughs> so can we start, Professor Atalar? Yes, please. Welcome and nice I to see to you. I want to say hello and I am leaving for listening. To, uh, I'm uh, moving on to the YouTube session to listen to your wonderful uh, lecture, uh, Professor Edith. Nice to see you as always. Professor Ozaydin. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ozaydin. So I'm going to the listening mode. So, dear participants, I am really honored to introduce, introduce you Professor Tunjer Edil. He is such a distinguished researcher and educator, and also a very good friend of mine for many years. Uh, his achievements and career is so long, I will be able to give you just a few brief information about what he has done in recent years. He has been an active researcher and educator for almost 35 years at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, currently serving as a research director of New Recycled Materials Resource Center sponsored by FHWA. He has undertaken several projects relating to highway construction, has been actively involved in the use of recycled materials. In 1980s, he was one of the first investigators to study the use of fly ash in generating hydraulic barriers. His research involving coal combustion byproducts has expanded significantly in recent years, involving different applications in highway construction, such as stabilization of poor subgrade and flexible pavements. Dr. Edel has also investigated the use of granular industrial byproducts in flexible sub-base or fill construction, such as bottom ash, foundry slag, and recycled asphalt. He has also undertaken extensive research on foundry sand involving numerous applications such as geosynthetic reinforced backfill, global fill, and subsurface materials. In the 90s, he has started research on the use of shredded tires as lightweight fill material alone or in mixtures with soils. Professor Edel serves on the Technical Oversight Committee for Geotechnical Research at Wisconsin Department of Transportation. He is a member of the TRB committees AFP30 and AFS70. He is also a core member of TC3, Geotechnics of Payments, Technical Committee of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. He was appointed as founding chair of newly formed ASTM subcommittee D18.14 on Geotechnics of Sustainable Construction. Dr. Edil is a former editor-in-chief of ASC Journal of Geotechnical Engineering and current editor-chief of Geotechnical and Geological Engineering Journal. He is the recip recipient of numerous personal and team project awards from ASC, ASTM, and other organizations. He is the holder of the 207th Special Science Award from Scientific and Technological Research Council of, Council of Turkey, Tübitak. So it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Tunjeredil, and I am sure he will 
we will have a very interesting talk to hear. Thank you. The floor is yours, Professor Riddhi. <coughs> Thank you, Kutai. Uh, <laughs> you took quite a bit of my time making the introduction, so I have to go fast. And uh, it's already past nine minutes past two, and people are getting very hungry. I hope my uh, talk will not uh, take as much time as the previous two. Uh, can we see the slides, Mr. Evran? I will be talking about drainability of roadway-based materials. This research was conducted uh, with two of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Huyun Jun Oh, uh, who was uh, <clears throat> a graduate student and postdoc, and Professor William Lykos uh, in our department in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, how do we change the slides, uh, Dr. Evren Bay? Hello? How is he going to change the slides? Can you help, please? Technical people, we need your help. Well, while they are working on, <clears throat> on that, uh, uh, let me keep going. Uh, as you know, when a roadway, a modern roadway is built, there is a riding surface, which is typically asphalt uh, and, uh, and concrete. And under that... Uh, Excuse me, Professor, is... I think we should solve this problem before you continue. Can you hear oh, us? Oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now it blocks my picture a little bit. Can you correct that too? Uh, anyways. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, well, subgrade is the uh, soil on which the roadway is built. And on the surface, you have asphalt uh, or concrete. And in between, uh, we have base, sometimes sub-base, which is uh, generally a granular layer uh, and has two purposes. One of them is to transmit the pressure coming from the uh, tires uh, down to the subgrade in a reduced manner so the subgrade does not deform excessively. Uh, and secondly, uh, it, uh, as water enters the pavement system, uh, it is uh, these... Uh, Base layers are granular and uh, generally highly drainable layers, and they would conduct the water to the side, uh, to the edge of the pavement. Uh, Apparently, they will change the slide when yeah, you Yeah, yeah, I, I can change the slide. Okay. Now, the statement of the problem that I am planning to present is that lack of proper pore water drainage out of this uh, base layer uh, could cause uh, problems. Uh, and the pre proper drainage requires, uh, required to mi minimize elevated pore pressures uh, and minimize free stall damage. Presence of water in the payment system is uh, detrimental. And uh, so how can we make a determination when we are designing a payment system that the material available for base cores is sufficiently drainable. This is uh, actually an unsaturated soils problem. And I know in Cyprus, uh, there is a lot of interest in unsaturated soil problems. So that's why I chose this talk. Uh, drainability depends on uh, first of all, material prop properties. What are the two properties that are critical? Permeability or hydraulic conductivity, so that the water enters from the rain through the payment system, gets into the basement, and it can flow out quickly. The second material property is called the water retention characteristics of the base. 
In other words, once water gets in under gravity, only part of it drains and the other part stays in the base. And how much of it stayed in the base and so forth uh, had an, uh, it defines the drainability. But there are other things that come into the picture. Uh, payment design system, for instance. Uh, the How the base is sloped to the sides and what are the drainage boundaries, the edge drains and so forth. And then finally, the environmental conditions, precipitation and temperature, how much water uh, is available uh, and enters the base. So the research objectives of this particular uh, work uh, has three aspects. One of them, uh, we conducted laboratory permeability and water retention tests on a large number, large in the sense of like 16 different materials, uh, typically considered for use as a base material. And we collected this from the participating states. And then uh, after running these tests and knowing the permeability and water retention characteristics, uh, we tried to derive simple, uh, let's go back to the previous, yep, uh, and derive uh, uh, predictive tools, correlations uh, of estimating saturated hydronal conductivity and the parameters of soil water characteristics curves from simpler properties such as grain size characteristics, D10, D30 type of thing, as well as uh, fines content, percent uh, fines, percent gravel type of uh, index properties. And finally, develop a rating system to qualitatively assess the drainability of base course materials from these properties. Now, here are the uh, materials with uh, highly varying grain size distributions and their classifications according to the soil, uh, Unified Soil Classification System are also given. Some of them are classified as gravels, poorly graded gravel and so forth. Some of them are uh, sands, silty sands, poorly graded sands, etc. Uh, the amount of fines uh, are also variable from one material to another. These properties are summarized here. I'm not expecting you to read the whole table, but we, are, we have 16 samples and we know they are D10, D30, D60, uh, uh, D50 and D60, which are the grain size characteristics, the diameters corresponding to those percent, uh, percent passing. We know their percent fines, which varies as high as, let's say, 12 and a half percent, but mostly less, less, well, well there is one 20 percent. And we also uh, looked at the gravel content. Some of them are uh, more than half gravel, uh, all gravel, and some of them are essentially sand. The uh, uniformity coefficient uh, and uh, etc. are also given. And the, finally, the unified soil system classifications. Here are the sands, gravels. The green ones are the gravels, and the brown ones are the sands. They are sometimes well graded, sometimes silty, uh, and so forth. But these are materials used in constructing base cores. So here is the test uh, setup. Uh, here is our uh, hydraulic conductivity or permeability test. The only thing I'm going to point out, look at the size of the hoses that feed water into the system. Because these are coarse grained materials, uh, the friction in the tubes uh, of the permeometer uh, could be the same order of magnitude as the material's permeability. So we have to use very large uh, diameter tubes to minimize friction there so that we are primarily measuring the uh, uh, rate at which the water is going through the material which is in this permeometer. 
for the soil water characteristic uh, uh, curves or uh, conditions, uh, we use what we call the hanging column apparatus. These are granular materials, so we, are, we can run these tests reasonably uh, rapidly. And here is the material in the uh, container, and you essentially apply a suction on it, and different levels of suction, and determine the water content from the water that's coming out uh, and uh, try to characterize the material. Here's some test results. Uh, the effect of hydraulic conductivity. In the case of sands, as you see, hydraulic conductivity as a function of hydraulic gradient is essentially constant, you know, there's no uh, trend. Uh, but when it comes to gravels, uh, in some gravels, uh, we see some decreasing trends with increasing hydraulic uh, uh, gradient. And that is because these are much coarser materials and the uh, turbulent uh, uh, flow may happen as well as some uh, uh, other issues. Here are the soil water characteristic curves obtained from that hanging column test. Uh, these uh, are saturated soil behavior or, uh, or testing and so forth uh, has uh, improved tremendously in the last couple decades. Uh, I work with the partially saturated soils back in 70s uh, and 1980s and uh, compared to those days, now everything is uh, much more standardized. Uh, and <clears throat> there is a Van Gnuchen model that can be fitted to uh, the data as shown here. Uh, and so you can express the soil water characteristics curve here with this equation where theta, uh, this normalized theta is volumetric water content. In other words, the volumetric water content minus residual water content and the saturated water content minus residual water content. And it is given uh, in this functional form uh, with the parameters n and alpha. So you can characterize the whole curve. Here is the uh, data, uh, for instance, hydraulic conductivity. We have the dry unit weight, we have the minimum uh, <coughs> uh, saturated uh, hydraulic conductivity, maximum saturated hydraulic conductivity and average value and the standard deviation obtained in each test. And on the right side, we have the soil water characteristics curve testing and what do we have? Again, the dry unit weight. Air entry pressure is an important parameter and it is listed and as you can see, it varies. But here are the Van Gnuchen parameters and uh, residual volumetric water content, uh, saturated water content, alpha and N, these two parameters. The average values for gravel and sand are given here. And you can see there's the difference. <clears throat> now, let's go to uh, drainability. As I mentioned, uh, as water enters uh, to the base cores, uh, it'll start flowing sideways because they are usually sloped to the side. Uh, and how fast the water moves will depend on hydraulic conductivity. But not all water will drain out. Uh, depending on the material, some of the water will be retained uh, in the voids of the base course. And uh, so if total porosity is N and uh, uh, the rainable uh, porosity is N sub D, uh, which is N minus uh, theta volumetric water content at field capacity. What is field capacity? Field capacity is uh, as the water drains under gravity in a soil, in a field, or in base cores, uh, as it goes through, it drains and some of it. Uh, stays in there. And the people based on tests on many different materials found that 
the field capacity uh, is the volumetric water content, which you can obtain from each of these curves, at 33 kilopascals. Okay, so if you have the uh, SWCC curves, you can put a line at 33 kilopascals and read off the theta F. There is also something called minimum degree of saturation, and that is one minus the drainable uh, porosity over total porosity, or the field capacity over uh, porosity. And, and this tells you how much of the void space is filled with water. So these are some important basic parameters. And uh, based on these, uh, we looked at uh, the values of field capacity, uh, etc., uh, and uh, uh, minimum uh, degree of saturation. And here uh, is an empirical correlation. The minimum degree of saturation for based on these 16 samples is a function of percent fines in the material. How much silt and clay there is in that sand? and with an R square of 0.75. And here is the correlation percent fines. And here's the minimum uh, hydro, uh, minimum degree of saturation. Uh, it saturated hydraulic conductivity is very closely correlated with D30, uh, the diameter that corresponds to 30% fines. Uh, and with an R square of 0.85, and you see it here. And uh, here on the right hand side, we have we plotted the estimated uh, hydraulic conductivity based on this correlation uh, versus the actual measured values. And as you can see, within 10 to 20 percent, uh, we can uh, estimate it uh, based on D30. And 10, 20% is not really a big number when it comes to hydraulic conductivity, since it could uh, vary over uh, large uh, numbers. Van Genuchen parameters, uh, and uh, we also try to do the same uh, estimation. And here are the estimated values and the measured values uh, for alpha and N, these are the two significant parameters. Here the correlation equations are given. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the correlations for alpha is not as good, but for N, it is pretty good. Anyways, uh, coming to the uh, main topic of drainability rating system. So I have a material, I'm going to use it as a base course. And I'm wondering, is this a good material? Uh, for that drainability from a drainability point of view. Of course, I would also look at it is uh, resilient modulus uh, to see how much it is going to deflect and so forth. But these are granular materials. Usually, uh, they don't uh, uh, deflect uh, as much as like silts and clays. Uh, so the mo main issue is here the drainability. We can base it on two parameters, saturated hydrogen hydraulic conductivity, and the uh, retention we can uh, represent by S minimum. Uh, we can uh, qualitatively classify drainability as excellent, marginal, and poor. And for based on hydraulic conductivity, these are numbers given Federal Highway Administration for excellent, marginal, and poor uh, drainability. And uh, now we, so as a result, if we know the K, K sat and minimum saturation, we can directly go to a table like this and say, well, we got an excellent material or a poor material. Poor material is hardly drainable. Uh, but in order to enter here, we need to know K sat, uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity, and minimum saturation. That we can do in three ways. We can make a measurement, uh, take the material, run some tests. It takes uh, time and money, perhaps. 
And another approach is to estimate this hydraulic conductivity and S min from grain size characteristics uh, and uh, as well as from percent fines. And this is uh, these 16 materials and based on their KSAT and minimum saturation as we directly measure, uh, these are there uh, for these criteria and these are their drainability characteristics. For instance, this material, uh, poorly graded gravel, has excellent drainability, uh, irrespective of the criterion here. I Whereas uh, this uh, number 15, a uh, silty gravel, is poor, as well as the one after that because of silt content. Here is the uh, number six, which is a clean gravel. And here is the silty gravel, which is clogged with all this fine material. Uh, in this slide, we are estimating the drainability, uh, again, using the same criteria, except KSAT and minimum saturation are not measured, but estimated based on D30 uh, for KSAT. And uh, so, again, uh, number six and number 15 are properly uh, uh, classified. And finally, uh, not on the grain size, but based on percent fines, because the correlation of S min with percent fines was uh, much better. So again, we have this classifications. And so based on this, uh, we can uh, have hydraulic conductivity on the ordinate and percent fines in the, uh, in the X axis. And we can draw boundaries for excellent, oops, sorry, for excellent and uh, marginal materials. Anything outside of these colored zones then would be uh, poor uh, drainability. We can also make comparison of the three approaches. Uh, and uh, of course, the direct measurement is uh, the best approach. Anyways, uh, summary here, uh, case set values of the Sandy materials were independent of hydraulic gradient, while uh, gravel systematically decreased with increasing hydraulic gradient, uh, potentially due to migration of fines and defects of turbulent flow. So if you are testing um, uh, gravel, you have to be somewhat careful uh, for hydraulic conductivity. Uh, hyd saturated hydraulic conductivity generally increases and with percent gravel, with increasing D10, D30, and D50, and D60. As these numbers get bigger, hydraulic conductivity goes higher. Uh, and uh, percent fines, if more percent fines, and uh, higher dry unit weight, then the hydraulic conductivity is lower. These are things that we would uh, anyways know. Uh, measured uh, hydraulic conductivity values are reasonably estimated with empirical equations based on D10 or D30. So you hardly need to run these tests, I would say, for permeability. Uh, estimates of uh, uh, soil water uh, uh, characteristics curve, uh, the actually the two parameters, when Gnuchin parameters, alpha and N, uh, and uh, indicates that uh, if we want to estimate N, uh, we can accurately do that within 10% of the entire range of materials. 
and uh, and for uh, alpha values less than about 0.6, corresponding to an air interpressure of 1.6. So the alpha estimation is not as good. I uh, continuing the rating system uh, suggested can be used qualitatively to assess the drainability of candidate base course materials before proceeding. And again, uh, it can be estimated based on either direct measurements or correlations. And finally, drainability is optimistically rated when rate, rated using the uh, second uh, recommendation, which is uh, indirect uh, estimates. I think that concludes uh, my presentation, and I try to make up some my time uh, so the people are getting probably impatient with the lunch. Thank you very much, Professor Edel, uh, for this uh, very exciting and uh, well presented talk. And it reminded me some very well known saying in geotechnical engineering. So they asked some uh, very experienced highway engineer, what are the three most important parameters in long term performance of highways? And his answer was drainage, drainage, drainage. So your talk was just <laughs> a good answer for uh, that, uh, how to assess the drainage of the base material. And for it, I think it carries uh, very useful messages for practical engineering. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I'm just asking Hojam if we have any questions. We are co because they have to uh, tell us. Uh, I am in a different room. Therefore, I have to Looks like there are no questions. I was very clear, right, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> I'm just checking. Or yeah, I can hear, uh, saw the message that there are no questions. Very uh, good. Sorry. Okay, no questions. Just I want to take a picture uh, of uh, we are seeing, so we can put it in our... Uh, uh, files and that's good um, i am ready i, I came know. to the previous uh, uh conferences in cyprus i have very good memories of them had a lot of uh, fun unfortunately we have to do this online and exactly. not in person uh, Okay. 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 I think it's taken. Uh, Tunjar Hojam, uh, last night I look a lot of pictures and I think on uh, three or four of them you were. And uh, I think it was six years ago. You were with your family and me and my wife and we took five of us a, a picture. Uh, yes, yes. Maybe I... for, for tomorrow I'm going, we are going to put these uh, pictures uh on the uh, during the sessions previous selection okay yes probably i i had uh, some hair like dr kutai has uh, in those pictures <laughs> definitely you had and myself as well <laughs> good to see you javid bay uh, uh, good to see you hojam and good to see you two of the uh, classmates, uh, which uh, I saw you against several other uh, things, but uh, also uh, when Kutai Hoja had his uh, uh, farewell party from the Academy of Never Gone, you were there with your uh, lecturer. Uh, uh, I enjoyed that as well. Thank you, Professor Atalan. Uh, you have been running two minutes of conference. Yeah, come to the parking lot, okay? In such a good way.
We are all thankful to you. We are thankful to you, Hajam. Without you, we can't do anything. Without Kinot, without chairperson, without the uh, uh, association, Turkish Association of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, we can't go anywhere. So your help is paramount. Thank you very much. Thank you. But you take all the burden. We realize that you take. No, we are working together. We are a good team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all the virtual you, or online, it's this is our in uh, year. So I think we did very well. Thank you. Okay. We will hope to be in Cyprus next time. Maybe in spring, not in summer. Yes, definitely. Okay. Or in in uh, uh, in September, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe September is better. I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, it's not up to me. It's up to all of us. No, I mean, I mean, the weather-wise, to decide about which, yeah, of course. which time of year is better is up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Tunjer Hojam. Thank you, Kutai Hojam. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, you too. Thank See you, you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And if you got time, you can join us. Two o'clock, we start again. Uh, now I'll say... This is a break time. It's uh, breakfast, lunch, or evening. In the United States, is breakfast time. Uh, lunch time is uh, in Turkey and North Cyprus, and in Korea and Japan is evening. Yes. So wherever you are, enjoy your meal. Thank you. Thank you. See you at uh, 14 hours Istanbul and Lefkosha time. Bye now. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Eğer ki Eğer ki Hayatımızda hiç eğer olmasaydı nasıl olurdu? Size şöyle söyleyeyim. Her şey daha az parlak, daha az yeşil olurdu ve daha az parlak yeşil. Çünkü eğerler Ormanların derinliklerinde tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşle. Eğerler Nobel ve Guggenheim'ın aklına takılır ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırarlar. Asla yalnız yürümezler ve aşırı bulaşıcıdırlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler günü umursamazlar, robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıla dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi.